Okay, well, it's Matriana's church in Tintagel. Now, it's a wonderful church for a multitude of reasons. Now, the first could argue is that it first come to notoriety, I guess, to a limited few, back in the day of Mary Magdalene, when she made her travels across the shores from France to here. Now, she had two options to go to. She could have gone to Exmouth or to here and arrive at Tintagel. Now, at that point in time, we know the church wasn't here, but we know this was an ancient, sacred mound and ground, as it were. So she arrived here and she travelled through, and this is where she'd arrived before she travelled right round the eastern coast, right past East Anglia and right up to Scotland by ship again, to hit up to Scotland. So this is one of the main points that she would have arrived at, which is absolutely amazing. In regards to, we can take that from that point in time, we know that my 48th great-grandfather, Lancelot de Sposigny, was actually here. Now, he was born in France in 520 AD, and he was here around about 538 AD, when he, when he came here. Um, pretty much on the quest and the travel to which some of us are probably doing today. Almost a pilgrimage, as it were. So, the church itself is documented in history as being here from about the 6th century, which does make sense here to be in like the 500-ish AD onwards. We've got some wonderful artefacts inside. We've got lots of um, hidden meanings to these Templars. Um, and there may be one or two things inside regards to Mary Magdalene that certainly scream out to me, especially in the lower part of the Lady Chapel, where um, one can always contemplate time and space. We're at St Werber's Church in Wembury, down in the far slightly east of Plymouth, I guess. Um, this church was built in the 14th century, but we know that it was visited by the Mesolithic man, you know, one of the main creations. So this, this particular piece of land has been holy since the dawn of creation. And there's a reason for that, really. It overlooks the new stone in today's world, but obviously it was a very different landscape back in the day. Now it has, when we think about it, we have... The princess here, or who was the granddaughter of Erkenbert. Now, Erkenbert was also connected, and he was King Erkenbert at the time when the kingdoms were divided into different types of kingdoms across the lands. There weren't counties, there was little pockets of kingdoms, and lots of different kings, a bit like they were in Ireland for that matter. So, we had Erkenbert. Now, the princess who was here was the granddaughter of Erkenbert. And she had direct connections over through to Ely in Cambridgeshire, or in North Cambridgeshire. So it's got some wonderful connections. When you think about it, it's the, from point to point, from this part down in the lands, right up to Ely on the East Anglian coastline, more or less. You know, so as it would have been back in the day with the marshlands. So it's really, really nice. It feels nice in this church as well. You can see you've got um, some wonderful stone carvings. Um, that's marble, which is amazing for the time of the day. And as we go through the church, absolutely amazing. When you go through the church, you, all you see is an awe of all the wonderful wooden carvings around as we go. Now, we also know that Lancelot de Sposigny was at this place around about 562 AD. Um, and that's quite important to note, because... We know it's always been a point of arrival, a point of area to come to, and worship's the wrong word, but to give recognition to spirituality, to a sense of purpose, why, why we are here, what we're doing, what we're meant to be doing. The church itself, as we know, has been here since, I say, about 1312, the so 14th century. Um, I think we've already mentioned that. There's the wonderful carvings, and it's, it's got such a lovely feel to it. You can see we've got the, look, the sin and the redemption here, just within this little piece here. So, you know, he's, he's pleading for mercy. And as God dictated here, he's literally just saying, come on, come on. And he's asking and he's allowing that it will be given. You know, the hand, the hand of um, point, really. But there's some wonderful pieces on here. If you look really closely, you can actually start to see how they all come about. We've got the archangels, as always, guarding around, which is lovely. They all have a slightly different style of hand. I'm not quite sure if you can see that, 
So they all tell a different story. So if we, perhaps we start from the left-hand one. This is one of Grace, over to the left-hand one. This is one of Grace. So of Grace, with the hands and the motion and the gesture, to prayer. To giving one's heart. in hope of an eternal life. So that's four of them. But they all tell a story in their own meanings and purposes. If we can just focus on to this one, we saw a similar style, didn't we, into some of the other churches, how they go. But this time we've got it quite different. We've actually got, on this particular one, there's only two here, the rest are all like patterns, but we've actually got the actual monk in prayer. And I don't know if you can see how he's holding his hand. His hand, the way the carving is, he's holding his book here and he's got a wonderful symbol on his hand, how he's holding it. And this time he's holding it like thus. I can do it. So he's holding his hand just like that, as it were. We've got a modern one. I don't like know what happened to the original, because this is not the original, obviously. Um, but, and it's interesting, you can tell this is much more modern, because back in the day, obviously, we know that the um, different cultures were not in this country at that point in time. Um, and you can just tell it's totally different, and it's a modern, it's a modern one, you can tell from the style and the shape. So I would suspect that's probably only about 20 or 30 years old, if that really be fair. Worst case, it'll be 1950s. Um, so it's not the original one. It's a shame, but I assume the original one's probably been damaged over the space of t you know, time and space. And this is pretty impressive when we see this in the church itself. This is obviously the, the tomb, and we can see the princess there and the prince. And oddly, which is quite unusual, you see the little child there just holding on. which is quite unusual to see on a tomb. And here we've got all the guardsmen with their swords, all in prayer. So they're almost doing a guard of honour, suspended in time, in order to protect the tomb. And obviously the wonderful Latin up there. And above the Latin, which is quite interesting, it's really nice to see, which you don't see very often. You've got the serpent goddess there, which is absolutely amazing. You don't get to see that very often. You've got the full serpent goddess holding the staff of wisdom there. And just below her, you have the angels. But this time, the angels aren't, aren't being... They're not looking so angelic, so nice, so pleasant. What they're showing you here is very much a, the skull, and it's almost quite a, a dark energy, a dark saying, you know, that this is who we really are. So it's almost like the revelation of the angels, as it were. And as we know from phrases, you know, for the angels will become demons and the demons will mask themselves as angels within the light and dark of the world. And words to that effect. So here we have some wonderful parts. We've got the Lamb of God, obviously. Uh, we all know about the Lamb of God. Interesting enough, earlier on today I had a conversation with my colleague about the Lamb of God, that it only became the Lamb of God because it was the only living creature available at that point in time. Had it have been a cow or a chicken, it would have become the chicken of God or the cow of God. So the Lamb of God, in, in my very many, many belief systems and many understandings of research, is was the, there had to be some kind of living creature sacrificed to appease God, which therefore makes God not so tolerant, but a vengeful God and a jealous God, as we, we very well know. Um, lovely pieces of work here, 1694, we can see that on the 27th of February. Anna Dom, 1694, Citatis, Suisse, 33, um, at age 33. So um, that's quite a nice piece as well. Quite interesting if we look up there, that's had to be replaced, and I don't know if you can see the difference. These are the original ones on this particular tomb, when we see them. And we can see that there's been a replacement over the time to the far left there, because obviously it's not coloured or anything. That isn't part of it, that's a replacement. So there must have been some damage to it at some point in time, I guess. 
But all in all, it's got a very nice feel about this church. Very peaceful. It's got lots of wonderful stones that haven't been hidden in time that are showing themselves here. And in the priest's quarters, which is his own private quarters, it's quite open, isn't it, for anyone to see, but obviously private for him. It's not locked, it's just roped. We won't go in there to, you know, to respect him and his privacy. But the, the, the furniture, the desk in there is just amazing. Yeah, amazing what he's, what he's got in there to work with if he wants to work in there and prepare sermons and things. So, I looks like to bring it down here to the actual main, main part. Which I always think is a wonderful piece for anyone to see and anyone to read is Romans 9.4, in particular Romans 9.4, 9, God's sovereign choice in Romans which is always quite pleasant to, to read. I don't know how much focus we can get onto that, probably not a great deal, but if anyone who's interested to read Romans 9, 4, sub 9, God's sovereign choice, um, they might get some revelations from that, who knows? It's not for man to decide who a king or queen should be. Never, never was really meant that way, to be fair. So, there we are. Which is right, there's a lot of things in this world that weren't meant to be, but they happened nevertheless. Again, you've got some lovely carvings around here as well. I quite like this nice little place here, which talks about the major Lockyer, you know, hoisted down the Union Jack in Western Australia for the first time, this claiming and remaining the third of Australia for the, for the Crown. So, this is about all the dedication to. As I don't know if you can read that, it says that this flag was presented to the church in 1941 by the government of Western Australia in memory of Major Edmund Lockyer of this par parish. Now we know that Major York Lockyer settled in Australia and then became usher of the Black Rod in the New South Wales Legislative Council. See, he became the usher of the Black Rod, which is quite interesting here, the Black Rod. Worth, worth some research if anyone is interested. The Black Rod. And again, we'll have reference to the Black Rod from Ely as well. Up in Cambridgeshire, so so many lengths and breadths apart, um, and yet we are here seeing it. And one thing to always look at if you ever go into churches, which is always really important, always look at the doorways and see some of the in important things. Or what they say in memory of you know anything that's of earlier stages, always be above the entrances of doors and memorabilia and that sort of thing, really, which is good. And last but not least, as we see. So, is a beautiful, it's a shame the light does catch it quite so. Um, here's the wonderful Royal Crest, and it's a beautiful original piece of work in wonderful oils, wonderful oils. And you can see them then obviously wood, wood framed and beautifully gilted, gilted as well, um, in the Royal, the royal Seal, um, which carries through time so many times, you know, through the, through the lands of the hearth of the lions, crown raised above with a unicorn and lion so that's always quite important to see that you know everyone wants to know why is it a unicorn why is it a lion it's um, perhaps that's a story for another day <laughs>